Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Tonight, I'll share why and how large-scale kelp and seaweed aquaculture can sustain Alaska's coastal economies while meaningfully mitigating for climate change. For the past 20 years, I've been involved in the research, management, and conservation of Alaska's fishery resources. During my time in Alaska, I've lived and worked on float houses in remote Alaskan fjords. I've been a passionate public servant, and I've even been charged off of a cliff by a brown bear. <laughs> True story. I touched my first salmon in the Salish Sea almost 40 years ago and have been fascinated by them ever since. However, it's also people that motivate me to serve salmon. Here's my family taking our annual fishy face selfie. <laughs> in the background, you can see coho salmon stacked up on their spawning beds in Power Creek. In this picture, our son Wesley is 10 years old. By the time I was 10, I had lived in five different states from Washington to Florida. I had always hoped that we would raise our kids in the same place for the entirety of their childhood and somewhere with lasting potential for their own careers and families. For reasons that I'll describe here tonight, I have real concerns for the viability of places like Cordova that are so heavily dependent on salmon for their economy, culture, and subsistence. I have even greater concerns for those who have relied on this resource for thousands of years, such as the EAC people, whose past and future well-being and survival are so heavily intertwined with salmon. And so, as I describe fish and fishy science here tonight, I encourage you to consider the human dimensions to this story. Climate change threatens the viability of Alaska's fisheries and the communities whose economies and cultures are dependent on these resources. Two of the most prominent aspects of climate change affecting the oceans are ocean acidification, or OA, and increasing water temperatures. <clears throat> There's a fair amount of science at play here, but please don't let that scare you. So what is ocean acidification, or OA, and why should we care? As atmospheric carbon dioxide levels increase, the amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by the oceans also increases. When seawater interacts with carbon dioxide, the ocean can become more acidic, leading some sea creatures' shells and skeletons to dissolve. On our screen here, we see a pteropod shell dissolving under increasingly acidic conditions from left to right. OA has and will have direct negative impacts on valuable shellfish species, such as oysters and crab. These creatures are critically important to many marine food webs and are eaten by organisms as diverse as tiny krill, salmon, and whales. Greenhouse gases absorb and radiate heat and carbon dioxide is recognized as one of the most significant greenhouse gas contributors to global warming in recent decades. The International Panel on Climate Change has reported that periods of unusually warm ocean temperatures have doubled in frequency since 1982 and are increasing in intensity, threatening marine biodiversity and ecosystems as a result. Otherwise known as the blob, a North Pacific Ocean marine heat wave from 2013 through 2015 was the most powerful on record and brought with it several mass mortality events in Alaska and beyond. This includes the death of 100 million Pacific cod, resulting in fishery closures throughout the Gulf of Alaska. The image on our left shows elevated sea surface temperatures associated with the blob in 2015, whereas the images in the center and to the right are associated with temperatures 
um, for it, marine heat waves in 2019 and 2022. Although these more recent heat waves were less severe than the blob, their rapid recurrence is concerning and their warming effects appear to be cumulative and persistent over time. All right, so we've made it through the hard stuff. <laughs> Alarming though presentations like this may be, I'd like for all of us to take a deep breath and indulge me in sharing with you a way that Alaskan coastal communities can act and have hope for their future. One of my passions is the marine aquaculture of shellfish, kelp, and seaweed, otherwise known in Alaska as mariculture. Kelp and seaweed mariculture has been promoted as an important opportunity for coastal Alaskan communities for, for many reasons, including the use of vessels, processing plants, and salmon hatchery infrastructure that would otherwise be idle. With more coastline than the other 49 US states combined, this industry would bring with it significant economic benefit, but it also holds the potential to mitigate for impacts relating to climate change. This industry is expanding rapidly in Alaska, as shown in this figure. But to put recent production into perspective, total Alaskan kelp harvest in 2022 is estimated at under 600,000 pounds, whereas recent production in China has been as much as 36 billion pounds. Alaska has a very long way to go if it wishes to compete in the global marketplace. Pictured here is Prince William Sound Aquaculture Corporation's Wally Nornberg Hatchery, one of the state's largest salmon hatcheries. This is truly a large facility with dozens of employees, housing, and vessels and equipment necessary to conduct industrial scale aquaculture in Alaskan ocean conditions. All beneficial ingredients for a rapid expansion of Alaskan kelp and seaweed production. The remote bays utilized for salmon aquaculture in Alaska are expansive. In Prince William Sound alone, hatchery subdistricts identified for aquaculture activity and related fisheries total approximately 200,000 acres. Now, at first glance, this image is fairly modest as far as Alaskan scenes go. However, what we see here is the first attempt to grow large quantities of kelp and seaweed in the vicinity of an Alaskan salmon hatchery release site just outside of Sitka. By now I'm sure you're wondering, why am I referencing kelp and what does this have to do with Alaskan salmon hatcheries? Well, recent research in Puget Sound has demonstrated that large-scale kelp and seaweed mariculture can result in a beneficial halo effect through the absorption of carbon dioxide by kelp and seaweed in adjacent waters. We're a fraction of this infrastructure utilized to support kelp and seaweed mariculture. The economic benefits would be significant with an environmental incentive. I and others would find this to be inspirational to see these facilities utilized to address predicted impacts of climate change and incorporating these activities into their operations would undoubtedly have a recruiting benefit for younger environmentally motivated workers. Finally, I leave you with this picture. This beautiful picture of Wally Nornberg's hatchery crew in 2020. These workers come to Alaska with an expectation that their work is environmentally friendly and socially responsible. Let's empower those with this passion to do more. I fervently hope that we are successful in our attempts to develop this nascent industry and in the process can leverage and improve upon the state's existing salmon hatchery infrastructure. Thank you. <laughs>